Now, although I don't think it's a good idea to be all doom and gloom about taking care of your watch, thinking that everything's gonna go wrong, I think it is good to also educate yourself on maybe things that you could be doing that could be harming your watch. And in this video, we're gonna be looking at six ways that you could be actually doing that, or just maybe some best practices, maybe things to uh, recognize and just consider as you're going about the day-to-day -day of wearing your watches, storing your watches. So in this video, we'll look at six different points, a couple things that I'll also mention. I'm not a watchmaker. These are things that I've just come into contact with, I've heard in discussions with watchmakers, and just from my knowledge and understanding, are generally not good things to do to your watches. Again, I don't want to make this a dooming gloom type of video, and I think many brands sometimes overdo the idea of maintenance and care, then probably is you know really needed. But also at the end of the day, these are very complex little machines that have hundreds of different components, so it is just good to think about how these might be affected. Now before we jump into this video, definitely check out the pre-owned section on teddybaldasar.com, getting new watches in every single week, getting great things from brands like Tudor, Grand Seiko, Nomos, Breitling, and many others. So definitely check it out, and if you're also in the market for selling one of your watches, not sure how to move on from it, we have a great program where you can fill out on our sell page, and if everything looks good from our side, we'll send you a prepaid label, get everything uh, covered and authenticated, and then we'll set up a process for getting you paid. Definitely check it out, buy and sell on teddybaldasar.com. So now for our first point here, we have activating complications at the wrong time. So let's look at a few common examples. I think the most common one that people are going to be familiar with is activating a date window at the wrong time. Now they usually call this like this danger zone between say 8 or 9 p.m. and 3 to 4 a.m. What happens with many of these mechanisms is that it's not an instantaneous jump and you'll find this with entry level movements and even something that's a bit more involved at times where the date is not going to change in one quick action. What's happening is there's going to be some disengagement and it's going to be a gradual shift over to that next day. So if you force change the date during this gradual shift over to the next period, you could jam, break teeth and just hurt the mechanism that is extending that date disc forward. I typically will always double check before setting a date just to make sure I'm not in the PM or AM hours uh, during the late evening or early morning, just to ensure that I am all good to go. Another place where you're going to commonly see this type of concern is with perpetual calendars or annual calendars. Now, most perpetuals and calendars are gonna have some type of built-in functionality or like an indicator on the dial to say, hey, danger, do not change the indicators uh, during this period. Something like JLC with their Master Ultra Thin are going to have an indicator just around the hands where it's going to indicate whether you're in that safe or danger zone to change uh, the perpetual indicators around the dial. And then you have even more advanced examples where Langa is going to incorporate a system where you have to, before engaging the pusher, pull out the crown. It's also gonna have an indicator on an AM, PM scale where you're going to be at. So there's a lot of ways that manufacturers are looking out for this, but I see with many newer types of enthusiasts, they don't consider this type of shift and change with the watches that they own. This is also a case when you're talking about chronographs, actually pushing or engaging those pushers on the side of the case in the right order. Stop, start with your two o'clock typically, and then of course your reset at four. Switching that up and out of order can sometimes not be the greatest for the mechanism and could potentially lead into some complications uh, with the complication. Now number two is going to be magnetic fields and just having awareness of where they're at and they are around you more than you think. Now again, I do not wanna make this a doom and gloom type of approach and you know, thought process here, but I think it is important to understand why brands sometimes prioritize having resistance to magnetism in many of their watches. Now magnetic fields can negatively affect the oscillation of the balance wheel on a watch, specifically the hairspring. Now unless the hairspring is going to be made of say silicon, for example, uh, that is going to assist in resistance, it can cause a lot of issues with the expansion of that hairspring with the oscillation of the balance wheel, which is of course the cornerstone of timekeeping. You're gonna find many manufacturers are kind of marketing this as a huge thing when it comes to magnetism and the resistance to it with different hairspring materials. But once a watch is magnetized, the coils of the hairspring can be attracted to each other or even stick together, effectively shortening the hairspring and causing the watch to gain time or stop altogether. Typically when people are like looking at their watch and it's just so off and there's no crazy shock in involved, 
a good chance you're going to be running into a magnetized watch. The good news is you can get something very inexpensive like a degausser. It's gonna be great in helping to correct this issue. I just bring this up because we have a close proximity to many electrical devices that are going to have some type of magnetic fields, something like MagSafe on your iPhones, uh, speakers, x-ray machines, a microwave. There's many things out there that you might not think have magnets, there's magnetic fields involved that could hurt the oscillation. You're talking about this small little balance assembly with all these metal parts and any little pull in some direction is going to affect the accuracy of your watch. So definitely keep this in mind. I remember looking at some photos that we were taking and I remember laying an automatic watch on the back of my iPhone. And although there was no issues, I was just thinking like, wait, there, there's a reason there's magnets in the back of that iPhone. That's probably not the best thing to do. So just really be aware of this, how you can think about it and really make sure that uh, you're just avoiding issues and magnets. Magnets are not friends with watches in that oscillation of the balance assembly. Now for another thing that is not good for watches is really when it comes down to shocks. Now, most modern mechanical watch movements are shock resistant to some degree, but some people overestimate the abilities of a watch in terms of resisting, especially large shocks or even vibrations. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about a slow distribution down a gear train of energy that's going to a pallet fork, an escapement wheel, and this oscillating balance wheel that is swinging back and forth. And it's going to be very precise in how much it's moving in one direction and back. So when you're dealing with vibrations, something like maybe shooting a firearm, you're talking about maybe being on a motorcycle or a bike and it's just constantly vibrating, or you're talking about swinging a golf club. It's these type of things are small instances of shock. Now, I don't wanna say that, hey, watches are going to be absolutely screwed over if you go ahead and do these activities, but to say that they will have no effect, you are taking a little bit of a risk when it comes to accuracy and oscillation of the watch itself. As a watchmaker, you want to keep the balance assembly in the same position and have the hairspring movement be the same with optimal amplitude. So having the precise range of going back and forth of that balance wheel. If you put a watch on the time grapher, you wanna have with say, you know, saying dial up, be like 280 to 320 in amplitude. If that's gonna be shifted or changed, what some watchmakers I've heard will say is like, if you are swinging your golf club because of that repetitive motion, there's going to be an effect of how that balance wheel is going to swing. You don't want a farther swing in one direction than the other because that perfect balance and cohesion between those two motions is what's allowing that watch to keep perfect time. Other thing to consider is just that there are regulating pins and how these regulating pins can be altered sometimes are as simple as just moving it with a small tool. So a quick shift or a shock could affect those regulating pins as well and cause a lengthening or shortening of that hairspring depending on the movement that you have. Now what many brands will do is they have things like a swan neck regulator that'll keep things in place, an Inca block system that's going to keep that balance jewel in the same spot. You wanna keep the balance in the same position also without alternating regulating pins and just the general hairspring oscillation. Amplitude, beat air, you have to consider these things and how shock could have an issue. Now this is why many people, when you're dealing with these activities, are going to like using cords watches. With many now military organizations using things like G-Shocks because of things of this nature. You can't afford to have shock have a negative ramification on your watch and its timekeeping. So this is just something to consider, not again, doom and gloom, but these are factors I don't think some people consider all the time. Now the next point here are screw down crowns. So screw down crowns utilize system of threads as well as a series of gassets to create a water type seal. And I was always somebody that's like, okay, yeah, screw down crowns, always great, no downsides, better seal, better water resistance. But one thing I've noticed, and this is some personal experience, we've had some issues in the past in the office with you know, someone that's handling a watch, uh, some of my watches, other watches, and how careful you have to be with the threading on a screw down crown. I think a lot of people, they just think, okay, screw it in. And they don't really think about how, just the same way that you can strip a uh, screw head, you could do the same thing with that very delicate threading on that of a screw down crown. These also can't be overly torqued. If you over torque the thing, that can have the same negative effect to really get that se uh, tight seal. I just bring this up because so many people are like, screw down crown, always the better than having a non-screw down crown. Well, if a manufacturer can sustain getting the same water resistance with or without a screw down crown, sure, it's an extra safety net. There are other issues that come with screw down crowns that people just aren't quick to mention. That threading will age over time. If you've ever handled like a vintage Rolex watch and they have this screw down system, you'll notice this, that the threading is not as smooth as it was with say something more modern. So something to consider, don't be just going crazy there and just screwing it in and have a lot of fun, screwing and unscrewing unnecessarily. Just keep this in mind. Number five, setting or winding your watch on your wrist. Now, 
I can't say that I am holier than thou here. I'm not saying that I don't do this sometimes, but it's not the best thing to do wind a watch while it's on your wrist. Now, this is for a couple of reasons. Now, in most cases, when you're just looking at just the watch and where's maybe one of the most delicate areas of a watch that does have some external visibility, the crown stem has to be it. When you're not pulling it perfectly out of position and say like, hey, you know, you try to pull something out of, you know, here, you have it on the wrist, you have the risk of dealing with that angle of how you're pulling and acting that pressure out. Crown stem is so thin, it's a small piece of metal and a small bend could actually hurt its ability to be pushed back into position to activate the keyless works and be able to set the hands and the time or wind the watch. Again, I am not the best with this sometimes. I have found myself actually winding a manual on watch during the day just on my wrist. I think really what you don't wanna do is setting the time. That's really where it's not a smart thing to do because that's when you're involving more twisting, you're pulling it out to a farther position when the crown stem is gonna be compromised in that more vulnerable state. I would just avoid this, take off the watch, admire the looks of it, put it back on the wrist, you'll be all good. And one other point before I forget, and I know the background's changing behind me, it's getting a really crazy storm cloud coming in. Overwinding, also another concern. Don't overwind your watch. When you feel tension, just stop. Don't have any just feeling that, okay, I need to keep winding, is it wound? If you have any feeling, or you feel any slight resistance in the wind when you're hand winding a movement, just stop and don't go any further. Now for the final point, just general good practices when it comes to storage. Now, I don't think you need to go crazy, get this awesome you know, watch box. People go nuts with this stuff. I mean, I think it is nice to have, but really what I wanna get into here is just put your watches in a really nice state of homeostasis. Don't have it all these changing conditions, whether it's like a lot of humidity that's being added, moisture, excessive light, uh, maybe you have an instance where you can scratch it or you have uh, some type of like material around it where it could get scratched up, especially when you're dealing with gold case pieces. Uh, just have good ways of storing your watches. One thing that I do is I put them in a watch box. Sometimes I'll put it in a safety deposit box. Just have a good way of storing it in a very st uh, static environment that's not gonna be changing in terms of temperature and things of that sort. But moisture is the really the number one thing that I would recommend here. One thing that I notice with people is like, okay, hey, I'm gonna go shower. And then I, I would do this too, like just take off my 30 uh, meter water resistance wash, put it on the say bathroom countertop and I'm just going in the shower, then all this moisture gets in the room because I do take hot showers and the steam could get inside that wash case. Now that's again, not the worst thing in the world, but also not the best thing in the world. If you're dealing with some of these dress pieces, you don't want moisture inside uh, the dial or the central case of a watch. That's not a good thing. So just think about these type of things, dust, debris. Are you putting your watches in like an area where there's just a bunch of like just dirty things happening? I don't know what you guys do, but just look out for these type of instances and just have best practices. Just go for a constant unchanging type of environment where you're not risking some of your watches. And uh, I think that really is all you wanna go for. You don't need a winder. I think winders are really useful when it comes to, hey, you don't like setting your watch every day. If you're one of those people, then it might be useful. Or if you're dealing with something that's more complicated, like an annual calendar, and it's just a pain to set, that's when a winder I think will make more sense. Whether or not you wanna invest in all these crazy things like watch cases, watch rolls, that's up to you. I think these are nice to have. I have many, and I think they are worth it uh, for those that maybe are on the go or just want a nice place that they can put all of their just watches or their collection to have it on show and display. But otherwise, if it's not for you, just really think about just a nice place that you can put your watches and uh, where they can be safe and they're not gonna be having these changing environmental conditions. But all right guys, that is six things that you might be doing to your watch that might be harmful. What are some other things out there? Also, if there's any watchmakers watching this video, I'd love to hear your take as well. Uh, some additional things that you might see enthusiasts do that are bad for your watch, things that you've come across in your collecting journey. Love to see those comments down below. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon. Really would appreciate that. Also check out teddybaldesser.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factor warranty for all the products that we offer. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I'll see you all very soon.